Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me fine? Am I projecting? OK, great. Uh, this particular talk is the result of nearly 10 years of student research. When the campus was preparing for its 40th anniversary, the then Vice President of Academic Affairs, Anita Olson, said to me, wouldn't it be cool to have a class on the history of North Hennepin? And me, being an adjunct at the time, said, of course it would be cool. I'd love to do that. And at the time, I'm thinking, I know nothing about the history of North Hennepin. At that point, I had only been on the campus for about three years. I was brand new faculty, fresh out of grad school. I know, knew very little about US history. I'm a medievalist. I study dead people, long, long, long dead, <laughs> like thousands of years dead. Uh, so I, I would kind of panicked a little bit. And then I thought about it for a little, a little bit. And I said, instead of me going and finding the history of the college, wouldn't it be cool if the students found the history of the college? <laughs> and so I turned it into a research course. And uh, our college has a lot of documents that go back to the founding periods. They're in these nice gray boxes sitting in the library that have only been touched, I think, by my students. Uh, and the very first semester when I, I had about eight students working with me, the first thing we did is open up those boxes and see what was in there. And I remember my students getting so excited about finding John Helling's original letter of application. They were like, this is the, the, it's the actual letter that John Helling wrote. They were so excited. Uh, or getting really excited about a postcard. It was a little pink postcard this big that basically was advertising a, a theater production. And it had air-conditioned theater. They're like, this was a selling point? Air-conditioned <laughs> theater? <laughs> so basically, what ended up happening is as the students go through the archives, they, they started finding things that interested them and then writing stories or writing history papers about what they found. And it was such a great success that I turned it into a regular class. It's called Applied History, which doesn't seem to sound like anything related to the history of North Hennepin. But the students who take this class, it's part of the history degree, but I also have students who are not history majors take the class, probably as many non-history majors as history majors. And they come in with various questions. And the question they end up researching is never the question they come in with. Uh, but it's very, it's a lot of fun guiding them through the process of coming up with a research question, looking in the archives, trying to find an answer to the question. And here's where I found that being a medievalist is an, an asset. Because medieval historians are trained to do a lot with a little bit of information because so few things survive. And so I was able to guide my students to learn how to ask very interesting questions about the little bit of information that they were, they were finding. I had one student write an entire paper on changes in the mission and vision and value statements that have occurred over the history of the college. She wrote an eight page paper on it. And that was the only thing that she was looking at. So, it's been a very, very rewarding for me to guide the students as they develop their skills as a historian. And this particular talk is based on their research. This is my compilation of the various themes that I found as they've done their research. And it also wanted to tell a little bit about the story of how North Hennepin transformed from North Hennepin State Junior College to North Hennepin Community College. And a part of that transformation is this idea of North Hennepin being in and of the community, which is actually a quote from John Helling. He wrote in a newspaper editorial in 1968. And basically what he said in 1968 when we were still North Hennepin Junior, State Junior College was, North Hennepin is a community institution. It is in and of the community. It is most appropriately called a community <coughs> college. So that's where the title came from. So basically, the idea here, what I wanted to, sh to do a little bit was share some of the questions that my students have asked and have researched that have led to the papers that have provided or formed the basis of this particular talk. So some of the early questions were things like, did the civil rights movement in Vietnam affect North Hennepin? Uh, which the student was very disappointed to learn, not so much. <laughs> um, he, he, he found some information, but it, the answer was not so much. He was a little disappointed. Um, what happened to the fine arts or the athletics program or the foreign language programs? The students are very interested to learn that we have athletics. Uh, 
Many people on campus don't know what our school colors are. Uh, they're blue and white. <laughs> don't know that we had a mascot. It is not the potato head. <laughs> we were the Norsemen. So uh, that, that's what our mascot was. Um, uh, whatever happened to all of the athletics? So what are the history of student groups on campus? So the various student associations. Why was the ES ESOL department formed? Uh, why does NHCC have international students? We have had international students since 1968 when English faculty Leon Knight invited a student from then Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe? <laughs> like, am I remembering my African countries? Uh, to, cert, to be an international student, and we've had international students on campus since that time, so we've had a long tradition of that. Uh, how did under construction develop? It used to be the yearbook. So we had four issues of the yearbook, and then it, it turned into this little, it was a nice, like it would look like any yearbook you'd expect with the hard binding on it and the pictures of students and faculty. And then it turned into this very, very narrow little paperback pamphlet, it was about this thick, and then it became under construction. So which is now an award-winning award -winning literary magazine. So that's where that came from. Uh, what was the attitude towards diversity on campus? That was a very interesting paper that one of my students looked at. He wanted to, to see how people talked about diversity, and he was primarily looking at the student newspaper, which no longer exists, called the North Star. So he was examining how students talked about various issues, primarily over the 80s and 90s. He was very interested in that transformation from when we kind of had the melting pot as our model and shifted more towards the salad bowl as our multicultural model. So it was interested in seeing how that evolved on campus. Oh, why did the campus need senior rap sessions? This was, this one, this, the student wanted to do athletics. He wanted to study athletics. It would have been my third athletics paper, but I'm like, okay, fine, go, go look in the, the archives, see what you find. And he's like, I found this really weird thing about senior rap sessions. I'm like, I have no idea what you are talking about. <laughs> like, like seniors from high school coming on campus? He's like, no, senior citizens on campus who are talking with our current students. I'm like, and he, he couldn't get over this senior rap session thing. I'm like, go chase that. And what he discovered by looking at these senior rap sessions was how North Hennepin transformed from being a junior college to a community college and the integral role that John Helling played in leading that charge, thus the quote that, that I just read at the beginning, that quote was repeated in this student's paper. So uh, why have so many politicians visited this campus? I don't know if people know that uh, Bill Clinton was here. So some people. And Hillary, yes. Uh, we've, we've had a long tradition of many politicians, from local politicians all the way up to the then President of the United States, who have come on campus for various reasons. And one of the things that the student who looked at this particular question discovered was that although they came with, necessarily, with, with different tones, they had different perhaps reasons for coming, they all had a common theme of encouraging students to participate, to be active in the government, to vote, to pick issues, to be active citizens. And that was consistent regardless of the political party. So that was an interesting paper. And uh, my favorite one, why did the original college mission consistently refer to students as male? My, my student was, this is really weird. And I, from my perspective, I grew up knowing that whenever you saw he, you automatically translated that as, oh yes, that includes me too, as a female. <laughs> but this student, it was something that she had not grown up with this particular paradigm, and it was very strange to her, so she wanted to research it. So those were some of the questions that the students ended up researching, and all of these questions developed after students went in one direction, and then found out that that direction wasn't interesting and moved in a completely different direction, which actually is a part of the frustration and the joy of research. You think you're going in one way, and then all of a sudden you find out that, no, that, I'm gonna chase that thing over there. So. So the unifying theme that the students found that in all of their papers was community. And one of the things I was really struck by as I was reminding myself of 
what the students wrote about was how this theme of community was recreated in their own words in so many different papers. So 2007 was the first year that I did this project and Jessica Schutte basically wrote, North Hennepin seemed to go above and beyond in serving its surrounding community. North Hennepin was a true community college in the beginning. Uh, she was talking about the first five years. That was her particular emphasis. She was really interested in that period. Uh, the student who wrote about Under Construction said, because Under Construction is a community college publication, the significance of its representation is twofold. It tells the community college's narrative to the college community. A commuter campus community lacks the familiarity with its own motley collective identity that a residential campus community may have. It tells the, community, the college community's narrative, too, to the off-campus community. The purpose of a community college is to serve the community, and just as the college must know the community for the relationship to thrive, the community must know the college. So she saw under construction as crucial in its mission of representing the voices of the community and carrying on that initial idea of being the yearbook, but not just a book that you open up and you say, oh yeah, look at this picture of this person doing this thing, or oh yeah, I remember that professor, but really representing the college from the narratives of the students, from the abstract art that they would produce, from the, the concrete art that they could produce. So she was very interested in how student voices were being represented in the early years of under construction and how it was creating this sense of community both for the campus and for the larger community. And then the final quote that I picked is, uh, the community colleges would be tailored to the needs of their communities and be made up of students from the surrounding area. The community colleges would have a higher degree of intimacy with the surrounding area compared to the large four-year college. And this idea very, again, goes back to being in and of the community that we are here to serve the community. And, and one of the things that really differentiates the mission of the community college from the junior college is that the junior college was designed to transfer. You take your two-year courses at the junior college, the junior level of college, and then you go to a four-year and you bring your courses with you. And at community college, it's not that we don't do that, we do. But our mission is to be whatever it is the student needs when the student needs it. It's, it's more than graduation. It's more than uh, get a job. It's what do you need when you need it? Are you here because you haven't figured out what you want to do yet? Are you here because you want to transfer? Are you here because you need one or two classes to get your promotion? Whatever it is, are you here because you want enrichment? Is it here, are you here because you want to go to the theater or participate in the senior choir or enjoy a cultural event like our Native American celebrations that we often hold on this campus. What, we want to be here for the community. We are in and of the community, and so we're here to meet the needs of the community. And I think that's what makes this place special and why those of us who are here <laughs> choose to stay here. So. It wouldn't be a history talk without names and dates. <laughs> so I, I have to confess, I am not a names and dates historian. I am a social cultural historian, which means that I am primarily interested in not what happened when. Yes, I do have to look at that, but I'm really interested in why did that happen when it did? That's the driving question that I ask as a historian. So yes, we play with names and dates and we have to know what happened when in order to know why it happened when, but that is certainly not the goal of history, at least not in any of my classes. Uh, I always tell my students, we invented this thing called writing that enables us to not have to hold everything in our heads. <laughs> so I tell them when I can't remember a name or a date, I look it up. <laughs> so uh, History is actually the study of the written word, so I find it very amusing that we have this idea that history is memorize all these names and dates when it's actually the study of the written word. So we're not supposed to be not having the written word with us. So 
But at any rate, the obligatory names and dates. Uh, I did want to give just a brief overview of the early history of the college. Uh, basically, we opened in September of 1966 as North Hennepin State Junior College, 414 students. And at that point, the college was under the leadership of Dean Dale Lorenz, who served for a single year before John Helling was brought on as the first president of the college. So there's this interesting little, we had a dean first, and then we had a president. <laughs> Uh, we originally opened in Osseo Junior High, which they had just constructed a new, new Osseo Junior, so the old Osseo Junior was available for us. And uh, right away, there was a talk about where is North Hennepin going to live forever, because we knew we couldn't stay in Osseo Junior High. So originally, this location that we're currently at, 85th and Broadway, was chosen. Uh, but soon after that, site was chosen, Osseo and Maple Grove started bidding for, no, maybe we want the, the campus in Osseo. No, maybe we want it in Maple Grove. Um, eventually, it was decided to construct here. Okay. Uh, in December of 1967, we received full accreditation, which basically meant that our, tr our credits were going to transfer. Uh, we received full approval for transfer in February 1968. Uh, and I mentioned that just because that was the, the first thing that Lorenz wanted to do. That what was most important to Lorenz was making sure that our credits were going to transfer. That was his number one priority. And that's very much in line with the mentality of a junior college that we are going to transfer our credits to a four-year institution. Uh, in September 1968, we founded our Women's Continuing Education Program. Um, this was a student group, actually. In 66, we had a continuing education. They're both called programs. One is a student group, one is an educational program. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. July 1971, we had our first senior campus invasion where senior citizens were brought onto the campus to have free health screenings, to attend certain classes. Uh, this was a, an institution that continued for several years and was actually featured in Time Magazine. So North Hennepin State Junior College was featured in 1972 issue of Time Magazine. Uh, when my student found this, I immediately went out to eBay and bought a copy <laughs> of Time Magazine off eBay so I could have a copy of it. Um, and she also, without telling me, bought a copy from eBay, so now I have two. <laughs> but more is, more is good. Okay. Uh, on August... In August of 1973, the state legislature basically declared that all Minnesota junior colleges were to be known as community colleges. And at that point, Dr. Helling was given special recognition for his role in advocating for the name change to community college. And we have been North Hennepin Community College ever since. So there's our names and dates. Okay, so in and of the community, how has North Hennepin been in, oh, that's the Time Magazine, uh, just for uh, historical reference. I didn't, I decided to do the cover. The actual article doesn't have a pretty picture on it. It has a grainy black and white picture. But I have to say, looking through this magazine was very much a blast for a past when it was advertising microwave ovens that'll cook your food in minutes. And, cassette tapes <laughs> as this new technology. I was like, oh my, this is fun. <laughs> so, but at any rate, in and of the community. So the first way that North Hennepin was in and of the community or seen as something that was important to the community had to do with the physical location. Where was the community going to be located? Was it going to be in Brooklyn Park? Was it going to be in Osseo? Was it going to be in Maple Grove? And this is something that actually had a lot of acrimony behind it. There were, uh, you know, basically as soon as Maple or Brooklyn Park got the okay. They started fundraising, and then Aussie was like, no, 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 we think that maybe we want to have it over here. So they started fundraising. And then another guy says, hey, how about if I donate this land by Eagle Lake and Maple Grove? That one seemed to be, have been swept under the table. It's, it's one of those pieces of information that uh, Jessica Schutte, my student who was interested in this, she's like, I know there was another site, but I can't find where the information is about this site. All we could find basically was that um, somebody offered land on Eagle Lake. 
but it was something that was very interesting to her. The real competition was between Brooklyn Park and Osseo. And they were going at it in editorials, and there was a Brooklyn Park editorial that basically said, Osseo's being silly, we've already decided, we've already established that it's gonna be in this location. And Osseo's like, no, 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 it's better for business if we keep it here, and went back and forth, back and forth. And then finally, I believe it was the legislature that sat, came down and said, no, it's gonna be in Brooklyn Park. And then, Apparently, when we had decided it was going to be 85th and Broadway, and the money had been raised, and after raising the money, we went to the property owners and said, would you be willing to sell? <laughs> so we did it a little bit backwards. We raised the money, decided on the property, and then said, hey, can we buy it from you? So the original property was purchased for, I believe, $140,000, and it was sold to the state for a dollar. So basically, that was the original purchase price of the land that was given to the college. But this competition showed how the, the local area saw having the campus in its midst as something of value. It was something that the community was very much engaged in and wanted to be a part of and wanted to have a say in. Um, the other way that the campus was in, and out, in the community was the second year the campus was in operation, the, the student population more than doubled. They did not fit in Osseo Junior High anymore. So they had to rent space in a nearby church. So the fellowship and fire, fire side room in the Church of the Nazarene was rented out and students were holding classes in there and there were faculty offices. And that wasn't enough, so they actually also rented a residential building that is known as Das Mouse House because they discovered that there were not just faculty and students in the house. And so it's, I, I can't imagine actually being in a house for my faculty office, but I've heard stories from various faculty about how the art faculty basically took over the bathroom. <laughs> and his painting, the, the, the bathtub was full of his paintings. So the bathroom in the mouse house was his faculty office. I, I, I can't imagine holding office hours in a bathroom, but I guess it worked for him because he could clean up easily, I suppose. <laughs> um, but they, they used, it goes to show, they used every square inch in that house because they needed the space. Uh, a couple of years ago, when this building was actually under construction, we needed space and we again turned to the community and rented space in the community to help house some of our classes. So this idea of utilizing space in our community and the community meeting the needs of the college when the college is short on space is a tradition that has lasted since the beginning. So that's the physical location. Uh, student activism. Uh, the student activism piece, so there's a couple of different aspects to the student activism. I talked about the politicians already who would come on campus. They came on campus almost from the very beginning. North Hennepin used to have snow days, dances, and, and things of that nature. And at one of our first snow days, Hubert Humphrey came and addressed the campus. And we also had a Canadian band whose name is escaping me at the moment. Thank you. I wanted to say the who, and I'm like, I know that's not correct. <laughs> but guess who? Uh, we're here for snow days, and that Hubert Humphrey coming on campus was part of a tradition of bringing political figures on campus to, to speak to students. And some of them came to a campaign. Some of them came for political debate. Some of them came to campaign for our then President Ann Winia, who was running for Senate. That was when Clinton came. Um, we had a president who was a politician, so that also explains why this campus has had a very strong relationship with our local politicians ever since the beginning. Uh, but the politicians all wanted students to be active. The other area where we see student activism is actually in issues of concern. Oh, this was my student who wanted to know, did Vietnam and the civil rights affect the campus? And the answer was not so much. But the answer wasn't no, not at all. And one of the things that he found very interesting was early groups that we, we've had a veterans group on this campus almost since the very beginning. Uh, and 
probably because this campus was founded right in the middle of the Vietnam War. So there were students who had friends who were going off to the draft. Um, one student wrote in the North Star about dropping his friend off at the airport when his friend was drafted. And his friend basically, the last thing his friend said to him is, hey, take care of my dogs, OK? And his friend basically died in action three days before he was supposed to come home. So those stories were written in the North, the North Star, the campus newspaper, that talked about students' visceral reaction and, and the close connection they had with people who were actually fighting and dying in Vietnam. So the Veteran Student Association was very active in creating a support group for the veterans. They had textbook exchanges going on, but they also very early on in their history planned regular visits to the veterans' hospitals that what they wanted to do was be supportive of the community, not just on the campus where they're helping each other with textbooks, but also visiting those hospitals where soldiers from the war have ended up. The students were very concerned about housing and affordable housing, even in the, the late 60s, that one of the things that they they tried to get going. We, we couldn't find out if this ever went anywhere, but they were, they were trying to get a petition started to send to the, the National Congress to petition for funds to build low-income housing in the suburbs. So they were trying to actually address the idea of the ghettos that existed within the cities by providing low-income housing for people so they could move into the suburbs and start making a better life for themselves. So it's, they, they were interested in their community. They, they were interested in helping their community. They were interested in engaging with their community. And we can see this in a lot of the student groups that start even from the beginning of the, of the college campus. So uh, in looking at student life, as I said, student life has been in creation or in existence since the origin of the college. Uh, our founding faculty included fine arts faculty. Jean Swanson was an art faculty. We had theater faculty. We had music faculty. We actually had extensive fine arts programs in the early years of the college. And when my students were researching the fine arts programs and the athletics programs in 2007, that's when the majority of them were interested in researching them, they actually mourned the loss of the vibrant fine arts programs and athletic programs. They, they talked about how we used to have wrestling teams and a football team and baseball teams and uh, volleyball teams and we had a swimming pool and the students were like, we had a swimming pool? <laughs> Why don't we have a swimming pool anymore? <laughs> that sounds really cool. <laughs> like, yeah, you know that room that, you're, that you go into where it's kind of concrete-y? And they're like, yeah, like that was the swimming pool. <laughs> oh. But in fine arts, we had theater, we had an orchestra, we had a pep band, we had multiple instruction in music instruments, we had theory classes. And when they were studying this in 2007, they're like, where did that go? Where did the fencing class go uh, for theater, stage production, stage combat, essentially? And the interesting thing is, is that since 2007, I wish some of those students had actually come back because they're back. We, we have stage combat back, we have an orchestra, we have a jazz ensemble, we have an instrumental music. So our, our fine arts program is, is revitalized. But the students at the time in 2007 when they wrote about, the, and, sorry, interrupt myself, athletics might be coming back. <laughs> possibly might be coming back. There's currently a, a student group and some faculty that are investigating the, pro the possibility of bringing athletics back onto campus. So uh, the students who wrote about the loss mourned the opportunity for community that was formed by fine arts and by athletics. They, they really wished that uh, they read about these great Shingle Creek art convocation series, also known as the artist series, that, that they said they brought all of these cool people and they brought these cool cultural events and, and people could go to them and students could ask questions and experience a life from a different point of view. And they're like, where is that? Uh, the students who wrote about athletics said, where is the school spirit? We don't have any teams to cheer, to cheer for. We want, we want that to bring us together as a community. So they really mourned that loss and wanted to see it come back very strongly. And it's actually wonderful now to be able to sit in this position and say, it's coming back. We're, we're bringing back all of these things. And, and myself personally, I, I find 
our art program and our music program and our theater program to just be such wonderful, wonderful assets, not just for the college campus, but for the community. I've had a couple of students go and, and see some of the, the plays and the art shows, and they just talk about it as a transformational experience. That for them, they go in with a certain idea, and then they come out and they, they just, their minds have been blown. And it's, it's teaching them to view the world in a different way. It's such an enriching experience that I don't want it to just be for our students. This is, this is for our entire community. Everybody should come in and see these art performances sorry, theater performances and art shows and musical performances because it's just such a wonderful asset. So, um, student clubs, one of my, my students wrote a paper on comparing the clubs that existed in the early, late 60s, early 70s with the clubs that existed at the time she was writing the paper in the early aughts of the 2000s. And what she noticed is that there were, se well, originally there were seven clubs. By the time we got to 1972, there were seven student organizations. By the time we got to 2008, there were 16 student organizations, so not significantly different. Um, I think now we're up to like 23, so we've, we've grown considerably since, since, that, since that period. But there were four student organizations that had been there pretty much since the beginning. Uh, Veteran Student Association, which I'd already mentioned, the International Student Association, which was founded very early on, the Student Senate, which of course makes sense, and the Phi Theta Kappa organization, the Honor Society, which has been here since 71 or 72. And uh, although my student didn't say this explicitly as I was reading through her paper, I noticed that one of the things that differentiated those four student groups from the other student groups that have come and gone is that they are consistently engaged not just with the campus, but with the larger community outside of the campus. The, the veterans who go and visit the VA hospital, um, we've had veterans brought back onto campus, uh, particularly for Veterans Day and other events like that to tell their stories and share their stories. Uh, we had, for one point, the Veterans Student Association was sponsoring an oral history project that was interviewing veterans of the Iraq War. So this is something that we have access to those stories here on this campus that we've been collecting. Um, International Student Association was originally founded so that the, the international students could have a place where they could relate to people who understood what it was like being so far from home. But they didn't just relate to each other and form a community for themselves. They also were very interested in sharing their culture with the larger campus community. So they sponsored an international day that was adopted by the, camp the campus as an annual event where they would bring their culture to the campus and the larger community was invited to these days. They saw it as a way to share some of their traditions. Um, one of the interesting things that also relates to the International Student Organization is when things were tense, particularly in the late 70s and the 80s with the Iran hostage crisis, the North Star actually went to the ISO, the International Student Organization, and interviewed some of our Iranian students who are here as international students and asking them for their perspective. And it's actually a very interesting article because it really emphasized or, or put a human face on what was going on that at that time, Carter, President Carter basically had asked or was passing a law that said all international students from Iran had to present themselves to immigration for investigation. And many of our students here were unwilling to do that and the, the, the student campus as a whole supported them in that effort. They didn't feel like, oh, we're going, we're afraid of you, we want to send you off, we're gonna rat you out. It was like, no, we're gonna protect you because we know you, you're us, you're part of our community, even if you're from someplace else. So it was a story that I found very, very touching, particularly given our current climate with people from other, other places and other cultures. So it was something that I personally found very, very uh, heartwarming. So that was, and of course, Student Senate is, is involved not just with student government on this campus, but with the larger Minnesota groups. The original one, I think, was called MUCS, which I don't remember what that stands for. But it was the, the student government group. It was a Minnesota-wide one that was before the creation of Minsku and MSCSA. So, 
So we've been a part of that since the very beginning, and our students have been interested in reaching out to student governments on other campuses and developing ideas and platforms that, that they can share across the campus to help students at two-year colleges. So um, under construction, I talked about with the quote in terms of how it was really interested in presenting the face of the community to the college, but also facing the face of the, the college to the larger community. And the student who wrote this particular paper, uh, Sam Savala, basically I, I remember her talking to me about how after doing this research and learning about the history of the college, she, she felt like she finally fit into the community. Uh, and she, she was actually really sad about it. She's like, I feel like I'm, I'm here, I'm part of the community, and now it's time for me to transfer. <laughs> like, is there a way that we can figure out to get students to engage sooner so that they can plug in sooner and understand the history and the culture of the campus sooner so that they, you know, recognizing that it is a commuter campus and there are the challenges of being a commuter campus, can, can we somehow figure out how to solve that problem and, and get our students engaged in that community at an earlier date? So, uh, so that's that piece. Women's Continuing Education. Uh, this was a program that was started almost right away, uh, very, very soon after the, the opening of the campus, and the Seniors on Campus program started in 71. These were very, very clear attempts to reach out to the community. The Women's Continuing Education program was started by Adelia Loso, who was, I believe, dean. Dean of Academics, if I'm remembering correctly, and Barbara Mantini, who was Spanish faculty and also very active in bringing Phi Theta Kappa onto our campus. Um, that program was very specifically designed for women over 21, mature women. And the goal was to actually help them earn a degree in a local area. The first semester, actually, first quarter, because we were on quarter systems, uh, one of the local newspapers published a story about how Mrs. Williams, mother of four, almost earns a 4.0 at local junior college. <laughs> um, this particular uh, newspaper was talking about how a mother of four could actually go to college, which was apparently unusual at that time, and get, you know, she was on the dean's list, for sure, but almost a 4.0. That was very interesting phrasing. My student who, who found this particular news article, she's like, why is she Mrs. Williams? Where's her first name? <laughs> you actually had to read further down into the article before you finally found her name in parentheses. <laughs> so her name was Doris. <laughs> so um, some, some interesting shifts there. But the idea that we can help women who are married, who have families, that we can create courses that are going to be accessible for them, and not only create an educational program for them, but also create a support group, because that's the Women's Continuing Education Program that I referred to that started in 68. That was a support group specifically to help these women cope with being mothers of multiple children while taking courses at the community college. Uh, the Seniors on Campus program, there's a very interesting story with this one. Um, the campus, North Hennepin, we're, we're on this site at this point, uh, was hosting a forum with the community about dealing with the elderly, care for the elderly. And while this meeting was going on, a white van basically drove into the courtyard, was driving up the sidewalk of the courtyard, and out of this white van pour a bunch of senior citizens who crashed the meeting and say, why were we not invited? <laughs> so, and the initial reaction was, you can't be here, you weren't invited. And they're like, this is our issue, this is important. And eventually, the, the, they started dialoguing, the campus started dialoguing, and that's when we hosted our very first senior invasion, which, as I mentioned, was uh, essentially bringing senior citizens on campus for free glaucoma testing, um, how, to, how to manage your finances. Again, this is late 60s, early 70s. Um, I remember stories about live, senior citizens living on fixed incomes from, I was very young at that time, but I remember those stories. <laughs> Uh, so things like that, financial management, and eventually it expanded. So we had senior citizens who were coming on campus and, you know, 
getting these free services, but then they started taking classes. We had one senior citizen who decided he was going to take public speaking because he was president of his senior citizen association and he wanted to be a more effective president, so he's taking our public speaking classes. Uh, we had one senior citizen who actually successfully ran for student senate. He had a chair on student senate and the stu the, he's quoted as saying, yeah, I didn't think they'd want me because I'm kind of old and I'm kind of conservative, but I figured, hey, what the heck? So he ran, uh, his name was Dan Sunquist, and he got the seat on student senate and then everybody started calling him Sugar Dan. <laughs> I, I don't have any more details besides that, but <laughs> uh, he, he was a representative on the student, student, uh, student senate for a couple of years. So we had senior citizens that were coming here, not just for the enrichment programs, but also for the classes. So very, very early on, we were tailoring our offerings, not just for transfer, but to actually help the people in our community to achieve their goals, whether it was being more effective leaders of their senior citizens organizations, uh, there was a couple other people who are interested in the, the um, forget exactly what it was called, but it was essentially the senior citizens who basically moved around the country and lived in different locations serially. So kind of like, you know, RVing, I guess. You know, you drive your RV to different places. So it was really in involved in a national network of these senior citizens, and he was taking classes here so that he could better be informed for how to lead in that particular group. So those are examples of how North Hennepin very early on adapted to meet the needs that existed within the community. And we're being responsive to the community, sometimes after they drove white vans on our sidewalks. But <laughs> The last thing that I wanted to talk about, and I know that I am running out of time, is responses to changing demographics. That when North Hennepin started, basically we were primarily college-age males. That was our primary demographic. But within a year of John Hilling, taking over as president and advocating the idea of North Hennepin being in and of the community, our demographic shifted up. We had a significantly higher percentage of women and a significantly higher percentage of students over the age of 21. Okay. And then when North Hennepin became North Hennepin Community College, we saw another uptick. So basically we went from about 7% students over 21, essentially, when the college opened to about 16% when Helling took over, and then up to 25% when we became a community college. And I think that shift in the demographic is very reflective of how we were meeting the needs of our community. Our students wrote about, well, getting a little bit ahead of myself, but as we had more immigrants coming into the area, immigrant populations, one of the things that the college had to figure out how to do is how to meet the needs of the immigrant population. And one of the things that we did was actually create a program for English speakers of other languages. And the student who wrote the paper on this program basically said, the, and Gerald Lang is sitting in the audience, so I'm quoting you. <laughs> Uh, basically said that North Hennepin had a reputation in the community for being a safe place for students who had come into the United States to pick up English skills. That we had more students coming in looking to meet this need of picking up English fluency than because we had this reputation for being a safe space. So our ESOL program developed as a response to that. We had ESOL, we are teaching English for speakers of other languages, but as our immigration, immigrant population became larger, that one of the things that they discovered was that students were having a hard time finding our ESOL classes. They were taking English classes instead, and they weren't succeeding. So we actually broke the program out and gave it its own designator so that it was very easy for our, our students who were coming here looking for these classes to actually find them and be successful. So, the other responses to changing demographics basically include emphasis on multicultural clubs, student clubs. We've had a lot of student clubs develop to support our shifting demographics. And we've also had a very significant shift in terms of how we as the college talk about our students. 
So what I want to show you here is our 1966 philosophy and purpose compared to our 2011 mission statement. Uh, very different, but this one, uh, students are consistently he and himself and he. And when we talk about our current mission statement, we have moved to inclusive language. And that is a process that we had some fits and starts. We first started with the, the very awkward himself, herself slash in our mission statement. And then we tried citizens and we decided that citizens probably wasn't good given the fact that we have a lot of international students here who are not necessarily citizens. So we went uh, back to the, or we went finally to the gender neutral plural they there and use the plural language to be as inclusive as possible. But you can see even in our mission statement how we have adopted to try and reflect our community and be in and of the community. Thank you. <laughs>